Hello, and welcome to episode number 25. This is season two, show number five. Yo, Oz, how you doing, man? I'm too hot. Call the police and the fireman, because XLTV going to give it to you. XLTV going to give it to you. If you don't believe me, just watch Jordan. Um, as usual, I can't follow up to that. I can't. But I'm here in wonderful Dayton, Ohio, home of Bacon Fest. That's the thing here. How are you, Denise? I'm great, and I'm glad you came between Oz and me, so I didn't have to worry about following that either. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to join you guys this evening. Great. Well, it's, it's great to have you. And hello, this is Rick Rantham, rickrantham.com, also of Excel.tv. I make uh, I make a dinosaur want to retire, man. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Right? I, don't, I don't get that. I... T tonight's show is brought to you by uh, Northeast Florida, the World Map, and Samuel Adams Cold Snap. Samuel Adams. Mm -hmm. If you're out of work and you like to twerk, Samuel <laughs> Adams. Go get your song. Lord have mercy. Hey, Oz or Jordan, how are we doing today with the Excel Challenge? Oh, well. I am Jordan, and I will help you. <laughs> I will help answer that question. Wow, there is just so much going on. We had all these new jokes. You know, this is a new Excel TV. It's a new year, new us. Okay, so let's talk about what episode four, four's question was. I asked you what year were Sparklines added to Excel. As it turns out, there are a multitude of answers to this question. But here's the thing: I didn't know that because. As many of you think, you know, you probably think I spend two weeks researching these questions. I don't really. I come up with them five minutes before the show. So let me just tell you the answer that I was looking for. That's 2010. And the person who uh, won that, actually, before, I have, to, I have to give you, before I give you the person who won that, I forgot I put this in here. Because Bill, Mr. Excel, Jelen says, Sparklines debuted as an add-in called Sparkmaker from Byzance in late 2007. The, Microsoft added Sparklines as a built-in Excel feature in Excel 2010, duplicating all the functionality of SparkMaker, rendering the add-in obsolete. Excel 2010 went to first beta in August 2nd, 2009. My answer, 2009. Well, that is a, probably the right answer, but it's not the answer I was looking for. I was thinking in terms of versions and not years. So I'm going to go, as the, as the constable of contests, I'm going to go with the answer that I initially had, which was 2010. And so uh, Rob Wardenberg won that, he wins a famous Excel TV mug koozie and, and a Excel uh, tables book donated by Zach and Kevin. So congratulations. So what is this week's question? It's a riddle. We all love riddles. So I, I, and not being me, but a worksheet function, I am a worksheet function that sounds like a number but returns a date. What function Am I? Now, if you know the answer, you're going to want to sing it, um, get it recorded, make a mixtape, send it into Sony, and maybe you'll make it. Or, or you can go to our website, excel.tv, click Excel, challenges in the corner, and leave it. Um, leave your answer on the blog post. Also, you can leave it on Excel TV's Twitter, or you can go to Facebook, where we'll post this question later in the week. So, remember, what am I? I'm looking for a function. So, switching back to me. Back to me, and now back to you, Rick. Great, thank you for that. It's uh, so how does that feel, world? Um, to know that the challenges that you that you slave over for two weeks, uh, absolutely no thought whatsoever by Jordan. Oh, know. there's thought. There's thought. Hey, it just he just opens up Excel and says, "Huh, oh, some this." The fact that what's so sad is how how close to the truth that is. You know, I have a list. I actually have a list of things. I have a, I have a list that I um, keep, you know, like I'll say, oh, I'll use this challenge. But then I'll look at it and I go, what a bunch of boring challenges. So then I'll go into Excel and go, hmm, what's something I could ask about? So that really, it is funny how that works out. I'd like to remind you that uh, Jordan puts similar, similar effort into the books he sells. So go out and get advanced Excel essentials. Advanced essentials for Excel. Go ahead and grab that. It's just a... Uh... So anyways, so now we're going to move on. Wow, it's good to have you here this week, Denise McInerney. So good to have you here. Would you mind saying hello and tell us a little bit about what it is you do for your day job? My day job, sure. So thanks for having me. It is Denise McInerney. Um, 
I'm here in Mountain View, California, heart of Silicon Valley, so really happy to be joining you all across the country and maybe around the world. You have international viewers. So for my day job, I am a data architect. I work at a software company called Intuit. You may be familiar with Intuit. It's tax Whoa. season, so if you've used TurboTax, thank you. Um, and some other QuickBooks, Mint.com. So that's what I do for my day job. And primarily I work on analytic systems, so I architect data systems to support the work of people who work with data. All the, all the time. It's great. It's a great gig. So uh, how did you become involved in PASS? So the PASS and Business right, Analytics, so you're involved in that, and what's your role? Right, so in PASS, PASS is my a volunteer job, if you will, um, and currently my role is Vice President of Marketing, so I serve on the Board of Directors. I actually got involved with PASS back in 2002. I attended the PASS Summit, which is the first conference PASS put on, which is um, truly really targeted toward DBAs and developers and architects and I was hooked because it was a great opportunity to learn tons of um, great education and awesome networking so back in the day when I was working at startups and I'd be the only DBA in the shop and you're looking for help I had a network of people that I could turn to um, online and then I'd see them at conferences and that's how I got involved in PASS and I started volunteering PASS is a largely volunteer run organization we have over 100,000 members I started volunteering um, again for the summit conference. I was on the program committee, and I helped choose the, uh, the sessions and the speakers for that. And I volunteered in a number of areas for PASS. I founded the Women in Technology chapter. So I've been volunteering for 12 years now. Um, eventually, I got elected to the board of directors a few years ago. So, and I'm here tonight because PASS has grown beyond um, the wor initial world of SQL Server, the relational engine, as the data world has exploded. And in addition to the PASS Summit, we also have the PASS Business Analytics Conference, which is coming up next month, April 20th through 22nd, uh, out here in California in Santa Clara. And we will have all three of our, our hosts here on Excel TV as speakers, along with a lot of other people. So that's why I'm here tonight, is to thank you all for all the support you've given for the conference so far and, and talk to your viewers about what's going to happen there. And then I'll pass this over to, to Oz real quick. But uh, down there right beside your name, you know, it, it gives the, the URL of the past VA conference, and it talks about a code, but it's a little hard to read the code. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? The code is Excel TV, and if you register for the conference with the code Excel TV, you will get a $300 discount off the registration. So if you're thinking about going, I uh, encourage you to, to do that, and actually register before Monday because the price goes up. So you'll save uh, an additional $150 if you register by Monday, plus the $300 discount with the Excel TV code. Great. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Think about that, Oz. Well, I'm curious to know, um, somebody's sitting there at home thinking, should I go to pass? Should I put my hat on and put the saddle on my horse and get it watered up and everything and go? Who should go? Who should go? Anybody who works with data. So, I mean, we all know that every day data gets more and more important. More and more organizations are trying to figure out how to get value out of their data, and across departments in every organization, large and small, people are trying to wrangle their data. They're trying to find it, they're trying to make sense of it, they're trying to analyze it, they're trying to visualize it in a way that tells the story, and those, that's the kind of content that we're going to have at the BA conference, those are the kinds of sessions we're going to have. Um, so anyone who's trying to develop their skills, become a better analyst, or become a better finance person, or whatever it is they do to work with data, come to this conference and you're going to learn you're going to go home with stuff you can use at your desk on Monday morning, and more than that, you're going to go home with a network. Just like my first past conference back in 2002 where I started building my, my network of, of all the DBAs that I now know, um, you'll meet people who have the same problems you do, um, who are trying to figure out the same kinds of things you're trying to figure out at your job, and you're going to be able to make connections with them. So anyone who wants to develop their own professional skills and their professional network and loves to work with data should come to the BA conference. Right. So is there a level that would be too low? What if you um, are just starting with Excel or SQL? Um... No, there, you should check out the list of sessions, but there will absolutely be content. If you're just getting started with Excel, there's going to be a bunch of Excel experts, the three of you plus about seven or eight more that I can think of who will be giving sessions at a, a number of levels, and it's a great place to, to get that kind of content as well. Cool, cool. All right. Jordan? 
Would sure. You, so, <clears throat> would you, you know, looking back at these conferences that you, you've been to, would you think that the, what, what has changed about data over the last several years for you, you know, and you're, you're working, because, you know, the business analytics conference hasn't been around um, forever. Before that, you said there was DBA. You know, mm -hmm. what, what's different now, um, and also specifically different about this conference? So I think what's different in the world is that data is no longer the province solely of the IT department. Data is no longer something that, that we simply keep and protect and store. Data is now something that needs to be liberated and democratized and used by every aspect of an organization, be that a business or a not-for-profit or a school. There's so much value that can be gotten out of data, but it has to be let loose, right? So that's what's changed in the world. And of course, big data has changed everything, right? Because now there's data being collected all the time, sensors and you know, think Internet of Things and all the different ways that data, uh, log data, web data. Um, so just sheerly, the sheer amount of data and the, the type of data that we can now uh, access and, and analyze, that's all changed, right? So for PASS, what's changed is our missions expanded, right? We, we've built a community of data professionals, well, the mo probably the most passionate community of data professionals you will find anywhere, all built around the technologies that grew up around SQL Server, the original relational engine, right? But now it's so broad, right? And, and there's all of the business intelligence tools that are part of that Microsoft offering. And there's Excel, and there's, there's so many different aspects to using data on the Microsoft stack that PASS has expanded its mission to meet the, that growing demand as well, right? Cool, awesome. Uh, look, so, uh, go ahead, Jordan. So, um, so PASS, what does PASS stand for, if anything? Is it... <laughs> Right. How does so, the name come up? Because it's always capitalized, so I assume it's an acronym. It was an acronym. <laughs> so when, when PASS was founded uh, back in the late 90s, uh, it stood for the Professional Association for SQL Server. Ooh. And its mission was for professionals working with SQL Server. But as we, you know, I was just describing, our mission has broadened so much. We're really there to be the professional association for anyone who works with Microsoft data technologies. And that is a very long list of technologies, right? If you look all the way from the top to the bottom. Too long for a name of an organization. Um, but also, PASS means something to the people who have been part of PASS for 15 years. Um, so we decided that rather than change the name, we would just start using the, the acronym as a name, right? So because it's, it's well beyond SQL Server now. Right. right. Well, awesome. Go ahead, Oz. Is, is this uh, around Chris Webb's blog post about a name change? Is it related to that? Yes. Yeah, so Chris blogged. Um, Chris blogged about the name change when we uh, after we announced it um, last year. Yeah, after we announced it last year, I think Chris wrote a blog post about it. Yeah, yeah, and he had. Uh, it sounded like um, some people were upset about it, and he he was saying that he agreed with it. Yes, I do, I do believe he agreed with it. I think he explained that it was part of the expanded mission. And I think people, um, I don't know if people were upset. I think people were asking the question, does this mean that SQL Server is no longer a part of what PASS oh, does? Okay. And the answer is absolutely not. It, I always describe it as this is an and, not an or, right? right? We are adding to the educational offerings, and we are adding to the technologies that we help people learn about. We're not dropping one to go to the other. So, so I do want to go back a bit and ask about we said that data needs to be liberated. It can no longer be controlled and housed and collected by IT. Um, is there some period in time where the cage door got open? <laughs> and um, why does it matter? So I think when I think the cage door opened in different places sooner or later, right? I think some companies embrace this early, right? Companies that are really based on understanding their data in order to make every decision they make. A company like Facebook, right, or like Google, which is very data reliant. Um, what was the other part of your question? Sorry, when did the cage door open? And and um, why does this matter? That oh. um, that is it's not just somebody with their, you know. 20 contacts in 21 rows in Excel. 
So it, I think it matters because by making by liberating the data, that my term liberating the data or democratizing it, the people who understand the business side of things, whatever that business may be, now have access to the data to help them understand their business even better, right? Data in the abstract isn't worth anything, right? Data when applied to a problem is worth it's it's invaluable, right? What what can what can happen there? So right. I think that's why well, it matters. Yeah. And and one last question then, Rick. Um, can you define big data? Because there's so many different definitions and um, maybe you, you even want to just uh, define it for how you use it. Well, how I, <laughs> there are a lot of definitions and I think to some extent it doesn't matter, right? In the sense that what, what big data provides for us is the ability to store even larger amounts of data and in, and in all sorts of structures. And that's why the big data technologies are important um, in and of themselves. But really what matters is what you do with that data. If your database is 10 gig, but your analysis of that database enables you to improve your revenue by 15%, who cares that it's only 10 gig, right? I can collect petabytes of data and not get any value out of it. Right. That's my non-traditional answer to the question. Cool. Well, thank you, Denise. Right. Could you talk a little bit about, it's, you know, it seems like PASS kind of came out of nowhere this year related to Excel. You know, it might be the first time that a lot of people, a lot of Excel people, a lot of mm -hmm. Excel uh, power users are getting involved and in, in really understanding it. It seems like it's coming out of nowhere. Could you talk a little bit about um, about the content, the Excel content and the Excel speakers and, and mm -hmm. kind of your push to have Excel as part of the conversation at the past conference? Absolutely. So um, this year is the third business analytics conference, but... This year, we also completely recast the program. So we took a look at the program the first couple of years. It was a it's almost a beta release, right? We learned, we, we uh, got feedback from people who attended, and we, we thought about you know, what, what we're trying to do here. And what we realized is that the, the mission to and, um, bring content to people who work with data every day is to understand their journey. We call it the analyst journey, although they may not necessarily have analyst in their job title, but it's the journey of the analyst. So it's finding the data, it's integrating it, it's cleaning it up, it's analyzing it, it's visualizing it. And while there are many tools that provide those sorts of capabilities, and when we have sessions on a variety of them at the conference, you cannot argue with the huge reach of Excel and how it's on everybody's desktop, right? And it's a tool that so many business people are already comfortable with that when you enable it as a data analysis tool, they embrace it, right? So I don't. I, I should know the install base of Excel. Of Excel, it's enormous, hundreds of millions, right? Hundreds of millions of Excel users around the world, um, and so we recognize that Excel had to be an important component of the program of the content. So we reached out to the experts. So um, we're we were fortunate enough to have um, Rob Colley from Power Pivot Pro help us um, give us some advice on that content. He was part of the program committee, and then uh, late last year. I had the opportunity to meet the three of you at a conference and uh, talk to you all. And not only did you all agree to speak, but you helped us find other Excel experts to speak. And so now we have, I believe it's 10 or 12 um, Excel experts on the program. I, I, oh, I don't think any Excel problems will be solved during the three days of the conference because you will all be, it, all the problems will be solved at the conference in the Excel <laughs> lounge, I'm sure. And, and, and Chandu is coming. Chandu, thank you. Yes, Chandu yes. is coming. Rob Colley is coming. I'll be seeing the three of you. I should have all the rest of the names. Help me out, guys. Um, uh oh, oh Zach, Mr. Zach Excel. Just Bill Jelly today. himself. Mr. Excel. How can I forget? Right? You know, Oz and I were talking about this, gosh, a week or so ago that, you know, kind of one of the bad things about being a speaker at the conference, and I don't mean this is any offense, you know, one of the bad things about being a speaker is that um, somebody else that I want to listen to will be speaking at the same time that I'm speaking. Right. You know, I, I was going to hate if Chan Du was speaking at the time I'm speaking. And I, there's, there's like three people in there, and not all of them. <laughs> 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 uh, because I may, I'm bringing Jordan on. They're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, hats off to you for all the, you know, all the talent yeah. you've gotten this year. I was, I was excited yeah. to even see this. You know, Zach Barisi was added today, so it's kind of a, it's kind of like Christmas. Christmas going over to your website and see who gets added every week. 
Oh, oh thank you. Well, we're excited too. Well, I, I, I know we uh, there have to be sessions opposite each other. We try really hard to not have conflicts, but I do want to add that all the sessions are going to be recorded. And so if you attend the conference, you have access to the session recordings. So mm. it's not quite the same as in person. And I should mention too that the, uh, I, I referred to it, but the Acceleration Lounge in the Expo Hall, which I believe all of the Excel speakers at one time or another are going to be in the Acceleration Lounge, so you can meet them one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and uh, chat with them and ask your questions. And what's, what's going to happen in there? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. it's, a, it's a place to come and meet the Excel experts, ask uh, individual Q&A, um, just meet, meet people who maybe whose blogs you read or, or whose TV channels you watch on the web um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get some advice. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to be on the lookout for those index match people. They, they come around making trouble. You know, so I, don't don't start any fights though. I'm not. Don't need I'm not. They they the ones that start them. I'm the humble man that wants to sit down and have some sriracha and be mellowed out. And then the index match people show up with their malarkey. I hear you, uh, 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 Uptown Funk. <laughs> don't give it to you. <laughs> not that. <laughs> uh, so with that, let's talk a little bit more about the conference. And Jordan, would you mind kicking us off with this week's topic? Sure, I absolutely would not mind. So <clears throat> this week's topic is actually going to be three mini topics. Now what are those three mini topics? It's going to be our conference topic. So what we're going to do is we um, are going to go through each uh, person's conference topic and we're just going to discuss it a little bit just to give you a conference preview of what's going to be there. So I will start first and then we'll go to Oz and then we'll just keep going uh, down the list. Um, so I'm going to start now. My conference talk is about principles to create outstanding spreadsheet models. And one of the interesting things about this top topic is that um, I am not going to present any um, formulas or code. You know, there's not going to be any hands-on stuff. It's going to be all um, conceptual. And what this allows me to do is say, hey, let's take a step back. You know, this isn't just about um, doing things on the spreadsheet. It's about thinking about the problem differently. Now, I just want to um, present one of the things because I, I love railing against things, um, especially when they're conven considered conventional thought. But I'm going to switch over here because I have a big thing about worksheet tab names, and I'm going to talk about this um, in uh, my talk, but hopefully you can all see my screen. So the, at bestpracticemodeling.com, they have this spreadsheet standards review board, or so they're called, and they have these all, I'm going to just try to zoom in here so you can see this. So they have different suffixes that are very similar to when you code in VBA that they think you should add to your worksheet tab name. So if we have a revenue summary sheet title, they think you should say revenue or rev underscore bo, bo being blank outputs. Okay, so here's what I'm here to tell you. Don't do this. Please do not do this because my argument here is that you should use the words revenue summary because that is far more descriptive than this engineering speak um, that is offset by an underscore, which isn't even really necessary. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Not, not everyone's going to agree with that. I know, but I really want people to start thinking about um, spreadsheet models and modeling data differently and try to move away from the engineering speak and more towards descriptive language. So I'll open it to the panel to tell me your thoughts, and you guys can tell me why you think I'm wrong. Think about that, Anyone? Oz. <laughs> Oz. Uh, no. <laughs> you got Great. nothing? Ah, nothing. I, I'm you guys good. agree with me? You guys agree with me? Is that it? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to be in there. I'm going to be in Chandu's presentation. <laughs> well, how do you know it's at the same time? <laughs> you're just going to tell him. I'm going to be like, you come and you're like, no, I'm going to go to Chandu's. I'm going to ask you every time to come. You're like, ah, I'm going to Chandu's. Well, what are you talking anyone, about? anyone have any thoughts about doing things, you know, modeling differently, breaking convention, you know, trying to make things more readable? You know, I'll tell you that, you know, in, in reading your book, you know, I could see where this is kind of an so anybody who's picked up your book right the first several chapters are all about this right it's all about what is what is convention right now and and what are some different ways that you can structure code what's different ways you can structure different things so I think it's a uh, I think it would be interesting to go there and to listen to you kind of put this all together because one it just in, any of those elements kind of taken by themselves you can argue right, right. once you kind of put the kind of strategy and one thing leads to the second leads to the third and you can kind of see how this all kind of plays out I think it's a 
is worthwhile. Well, that's just one one small facet. But the main argument is that the best Excel models have uh, good design and layout. So, like you know, kind of Edward top data visualization, keep the junk off. Good um, code and formulas, get rid of you know volatile formulas uh, that don't help. Um, and good like naming practices. And then the last bit is good data visualization. So that's what I that's the argument of my talk. In fact, that's the essence of it. Um, you don't even need to go anymore. <laughs> good modeling. Good modeling. Okay. So and what about you, uh, do, you have a, do you have a second topic as well? I do, I do, but I, I don't want to give that away. I don't want to uh, give that away totally yet. I'll say it's about it's about how we th um, how we make bad decisions with data and how we need to place uh, data analysis correctly um, into our decision making. Here, I'll give you I'll give you one real quick um, insight on that. So you guys, um, so like you know, money balls is held up as this like standard of of great data modeling, but you know the Oakland A's didn't really make it. Uh, they didn't make it to the World Series. Um, the real thing about it was that he got, he was able to use these, um, or Billy Bean used these uh, um, econometrics stuff to figure out how to get good baseball players very cheaply. Um, but it didn't really make the team much better. It just made it more affordable. And then the other one is the Netflix challenge. Netflix had this um, challenge uh, years ago about how to fix, like, to make a better recommendation engine. And they had all these data teams. So it was this big million dollar challenge. They had all these data modeling teams. Um, and this team came up with this awesome uh, machine learning algorithm. And they got a million dollars for it. It was held up as the gamification example, the example of big data. It was held up as like the precursor of everything we love about like our current big data world we live in right now. And the truth is it was too computationally expensive for Netflix to implement. So they never implemented it. In fact, the recommendations you see when you watch Netflix are based off of humans watching it and categorizing them. That's so this is, these are the misunderstandings wow. we have about data. Wow. Now that's so. really cool. Well, actually, that's, that's that kind of, go ahead, Oz. No, I just think um, that, you know, man, think about, you know, the, the, the book I'm writing now, I'm painting a real world context around things that, um, we talk about different tricks and tips and tools and different things, but then reality hits and you don't have the money. You don't have the time. Somebody's going on vacation and you got to figure something out. Um, so all this grandiose stuff, well, is great until somebody says, I'm not going for that. You know, now what do you do? You know, so um, I like that those examples you gave because um, it shows, yeah, the real world constraints on things and um, that there might not be anything really fancy behind there after all. There's people getting stuff done as best they can. Yeah, I mean, you know, we often forget there's a human element. I mean, you know, reduce it to its parts, whether it's this talk or my other talk. I'm just trying to make things more accessible to humans, you know, not at, not engineers who aren't human. No, I'm just joking about that. But, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have a hate mail email line that you guys can send your stuff to. So, uh, any thoughts on that, Denise? Well, actually, I think it's it's an important point because this goes back to the data being useful to people, right? So, it's it's all if the humans can't do something with it or the humans don't understand what the story you're telling even, right? So you can have the most brilliant predictive model in the world, right? It can be tuned to within an inch of its life, but if you can't explain to an executive what that model's really telling you about your customers or whatever you're, you know, whatever you're studying, then it's not really worth much, right? So so I think the human element is so important and, and actually, if I can bring it back to the conference for a second, one of the tracks we've got is called Communicate and Lead, and it's really about that part, right? It's really about that aspect of how do you take all this great information you now have and, and help lead your organization or lead your team with it, right? So I'm with you. I think that, um, that kind of parlays pretty well into, into my topics, uh, which are categorized as, I think, visualize or something like that, but they're really Communicate and Lead type things. And so the first one is uh, create an effective reporting strategy. 
It's kind of ironic that you brought up Netflix because Netflix will be uh, one of my examples. Uh, or, or how do you go about um, identifying the type of leader that there is in the organization, right? Whether that's an analytic leader or not an analytic leader, to determine what sort of strategy you should have in in attacking the rollout of your tools, including Excel and including your databases, the entire technology layer, the the reporting layer and all of that sort of stuff. So not only identifying what type of leader is there in the organization, but identifying your approach based on what you find. And, and there's kind of a, and I'll go through this, uh, so people who are die-hard kind of business intelligence people, I'm a TDWI guy, so die-hard business intelligence people will say, okay, well I kind of already understand what a business intelligence maturity model is, Rick, thank you. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through each of the individual layers and why it is that you have low adoption, why it is that people aren't adopting your tools, why it is that you're, you're struggling and you've rolled out millions of dollars worth of tools and, and just nobody's using it, and who you need to get on your side, and, and guess what, it's usually the Excel people, it's usually the analysts, so we're going to talk through that quite a bit. We're also going to get to some of the higher level stuff, so that you know, I'm not necessarily talking to the data scientists in the room, so, you know, but what we will talk to is Whenever we talk about prediction, what do we mean? You know, we'll, we'll walk through a, a very simple regression model, and we'll, we'll put that in the context of Six Sigma, you know, Y equals F of X, and we'll talk about prediction, what that means, and what you need to be able to create in your prediction model so that you can actually change your business, so that you can change the inputs, you can change the root cause driver. So that'll be a good portion of that conversation. Um, number two, though, the, the second topic I'll talk to is more of a hands-on, right? And this is a little bit more detailed. The first conversation is much higher level as talking to executives and directors. The next one is talking to the guy on the ground. And it's called Making Informed Decisions, Guidelines for Creating Effective Dashboards. Now, this is very much a how do you do it, right? And I'm gonna bring up, I think it's six or seven steps. I'm bringing up about seven steps. And I'm gonna bring up examples of how you go about determining what needs to be on your dashboard. And here's what most people do, right? Most analysts, most people who are trying to figure out what's going to be on their dashboard, they'll go and knock on the executive's door and they'll say, hey, what you want on your dashboard? You know, the problem with that is that's not very proactive, right? You're waiting on someone else to give you the information. So what I'm going to show you how to do is how to be proactive. How can you walk into that into that office, walk into that meeting, and act like you have your stuff together. You know, know when to bring in an annual report into that meeting and when not to. Because if you do, just that decision right there could be a killer. And I'll walk through real life examples of where I've made those mistakes. And, you know, and the appropriate. And, and additionally, there's like six or seven steps in creating this. I don't even get to the actual build. The, the furthest I get into that is building your mock-ups, your mock-ups for your dashboards, and what are some best practices, we'll show Excel examples. And here's the cool thing about this one, though, is in this one, I'm gonna bring up, for each individual tip, this isn't a, hey, you need to get these six or seven, seven data elements, you know, for your, for your requirements. What it is, is I'm gonna bring up the Excel spreadsheet, I'm gonna show you, get this, 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 fill out this spreadsheet. And these are the, these are the sort of data elements you need for your dashboard. Here's how you determine the sorts of reports that need to come after you build your dashboard. And so how do you create a strategy around that? So that's going to be very, uh, much more hands-on. There'll be, uh, be real life examples. So any thoughts? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's almost like, um, you know, whether it's like the executive or, you know, the lower level person, it's, you know, people don't know where to start. You know, they see the data in front of them and they're like, you know, what do I do with it? Or I, I've been tasked to make a dashboard. Where do I go from here? So it's it's very interesting. So it's mo it's about communicating, but also leading the charge, right? So it fits really well into that um, into that track, I would think. You know, I like, I like um, when you're talking about knowing what kind of leader you have. That is so important because um, you know because you you definitely want your stuff um, accurate, right? Um, but you know, I remember the the one analyst who trained me. He came out of the out of the out of an office with an executive, and he was all shook up. And um, he said that that guy in he is scary because he can do this crazy math in his head, 
he looked at the analyst paper and he's like doing the math. He said that should be about seventeen percent, and you got twenty four percent in here. What is this? And threw his papers back at him. <laughs> exactly. Seventeen and a half percent in your head. What? <laughs> uh, Ozzy, even just take the take the Netflix example, right? The Netflix example. The reason it's going in that direction. You can take Amazon, and you can take others as well. The reason they're going in the direction they're going. There's a very good book on this, which I'll leave in the. You know, I'll leave in the comments section below. So this is a this is an original thinking by Rick. You know, so some good books on this. Wow. But um, you know, the the CEO was his name Reed Hastings, I believe, of Netflix. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But hey, this guy has a, a, I believe it was a master's degree and is an ops management or you know the decision science where you're doing um, uh, where you're building optimization models. Operations Fresh research, there. right? But you know, this guy has a has a master's degree in this stuff, if I recall correctly. The same thing with with Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon. I mean, this guy was working on a quant team, if I remember, on Wall Street. You yes. know, before he started. I mean, so there's there are and this is very very minute part of your executive leaders who are, who are ready to do this, and and because us as analysts, that's the way we think. Mm -hmm. We think all of our leaders should think that way too. And the truth is, quite a, a large portion of our leaders don't think that way. Right. They see, and they see analysis, and they they see it all as not an not that you're building an asset. They see that you are trying to reduce an expense. How can we automate huh. this report? Right. Right. Uh -huh. So exactly. we're going to talk about how do you figure that out? How do you figure it out real quick? And right. what what should your strategy be on either way? Yep, and 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 where where I was going with this is you know contrasting this against somebody else who was very much a people person, and so I dealt with him in a different kind of way where when he would go in with my numbers, I really, um, really had to have things tight because if he went in there and had a problem, he was going to be embarrassed. He wasn't going to be able to do stuff in his head and figure it out there in a meeting. He was going to come back to me. You know, he's going to be mad with me and then embarrassed with them. So um, understanding those different kinds of leadership, yeah, it's, it's very important. How about you, Oz? You're speaking as well. Well, no, I'm, I'm wondering if, if Denise has some comments about yours, and I've got yeah. more. Well, so what I was thinking as, as Rick was talking was that um, – it's true that there's definitely a variance in terms of uh, executive leaders and how much they understand why data is important, but I think more and more <laughs> they're looking around and seeing that the organizations that know how to do things with their data are going to beat them or are beating them, right? So then the people in their organizations who can help them with their data, who can explain it to them, you, you just have to find the way to do it. They're going to become more and more valuable. And I think that's why, you know, it's a, it's a bottoms up approach, right? But I think it can be I think it can be really powerful. Yeah, you know, um, but it, what I think about it in response to that is coming across businesses where things are good enough. Let them beat us. You know, there's enough for everybody, and I'm not trying to get it all. You know, I've got my BMW, and the bills are paid, and okay, and I'll continue to just guess at what the numbers are, and I'll check the inventory by going to look in the bin. It's worked so far. <laughs> so you know what I you know what my response is to that? I think you're right, Oz, but then I'd say there's plenty of other opportunities for people who really dig data, who have the passion for making value out of data, for working with data. There are places where that skill is valued more than you can imagine. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. and that's just more and more in demand all the time, right? And mm -hmm. and if, so for from a personal perspective in your own career, right? right? People people should I think people who work with data, who are Excel uh, pros, who, who know how to munge and get value out of data, their future is very rosy because mm -hmm. the demand is just increasing um, beyond what they even realize. Wow. And you can come to the conference and meet, meet each other and network right. and learn more That's about right. that. That's right. That's right. How about you, Oz? Well, mine is the pain and glory of data preparation. Because managing data is a sport. There's there's pain in it. There's glory in it. There's the pain when you mess up somebody's money and they come choke you and they kick your desk. 
there's glory when you when you turn things around when you get insights and open things up and lead people into the sunlight. Um, so, but this is taking me back to where I started dealing with data because um, it started with people calling up mad about something, and I'm digging around, digging around, and I gave myself the permission to get up off my desk and go dig into this data. That was not my job. And I kept getting in trouble for it, but I got tired of these people calling too. So I just took the risk and um, yeah, you find out somebody's got eight profiles in the data. Um, you know, cleaning that yes. stuff out, dig it, peeling things away from each other item codes from the item, all of that kind of stuff. So this is where, see, you pretty guys with your, with your dashboards and stuff, y'all are up on the front, right? Right, y'all get to get to interviews in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the locker room after the game. But then what? who did all the dirty stuff? Who did that dirty stuff to peel all that stuff out? People putting nicknames and stuff in mixed with their regular name. Somebody's got to peel that stuff out. So that the pretty folks can uh, make their dashboards and get all the glory in the interviews. So um, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, you know, uh, talking about our uh, Power Query and some of the powerful things that are in Power Query that can help you start um, parsing lines of text, unpivot. Um, what else? We'll talk about. Um, Quite a few things there that help you get your data clean. Um, when data comes at you looking like a report, how do you get it into just a big wall of rows and columns? You know, the data looked like it was made for printing labels. Okay, I need sortable rows and columns, not blocks of, of data. So, um, and I, it's important because, for one, it's not taught. Because when you go to learn analytics, you don't spend a month cleaning data and then do your three-day analytics course. No, that, that makes no sense. So, so it's understandable. But then a person takes the three-day analytics course or the semester-long analytics course and then get, get out into the world and oh, we just broke all this information out of a PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Make me a pretty dashboard. Okay. So I, if I if I'm allowed to say this, I have to say Oz's session title is one of my favorites at the conference. <laughs> right. the pain and glory data preparation. But this is such an important. So so here's the thing, right? Uh, you're exactly right. Most analysts will tell you they spend far more time finding the data and making sense out of it than they do the actual analysis and visualization, right? Because it's so messy, right? It's so messy. Um, and anything that can help you cut that time by increasing your productivity is going to be extremely valuable because it's one thing is drudge work. For another thing, there's always more of it to do, right? So yeah. I, th um, I'm, I expect that if people go to your session, Oz, that they're going to pick up some tips, right, where mm -hmm. that'll that'll make them better at it, right, and allow it to go a little bit faster. Yep, yep, and and that's a, a great point where you say that, that the analysis can be pretty easy, but getting it out, that's the hard part. And um, I did a session at a medical school with his postdoc students with all his genome information. You know, one person, she needed a single formula but it had to be nested in the right way and it needed to have um, the uh, absolute and relative cell references set right and then she could drag across and down and she, her data cleansing was done. That's all she needed. Um, but you know, until I got there to do that session with them, yeah, she could lose a whole day moving that stuff around. So it's about, you know, increasing productivity. Mm -hmm. And for so, so many people, like your example, who are working with data, that's not their actual job, right? Her job right. was right, a research position or something, but she needed the data in order to do her job. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. a lot of people like that in all kinds of fields. Mm -hmm. Now, as a pretty boy, as, as a, boy, as a good-looking 
dashboard pretty boy. I got to say a few things on this, all right? So let me just say this, all right? Because I don't actually really disagree with Oz, but I cut my teeth on data wrangling. I didn't just start out in dashboards. In fact, you find out the best ones out there, you know, the people who really know what they're doing, they'll tell you that that's where they started. I didn't I landed in dashboards because I became the guy who knew how to fix the data. Everyone else was just jumping in. They're like, oh, this doesn't work. And they'd say, oh, well, what's the problem? And we'd go trace it back and say, oh, well, Jacob you know, Smith exists in here nine times. Why does he exist? And here, he's got two C's in his name. You know, this is how I started out. Right. So I'm just saying, yeah. you know, uh, this is important skills because this is like the stuff that they go, oh, well, that's on the job. Oh, you'll learn that as you go. Well, some people learn terrible habits as they go. They learn to ignore it. They don't learn how to fix it. They learn to ask their buddy who's going to get that next promotion instead of them. So I think this is a good talk because why aren't we teaching this in class? Well, you know, why one, isn't this part of it? One thing is there are some things that you do one time in life ever. So you really got to think about the tools that you have, the way that you can weave them together and set things up and and think ten steps ahead, right? And and have a strategy to where you you clear the low hanging fruit out of the way, and then you just start uh, working your way through it, rather than you know, because you know I saw somebody last week they started building this massive formula that was going to do everything in one drag down. No, no. Maybe you take half of this and deal with this because it's all the same, but you got to think about how can I look at this to see what is all the same and deal with that. It's, that's, that's strategy, and you never know. Um, you break something out of a PDF, you don't know how it's going to look, but you got to know that when you put your helmet on, it is not going to whoop you when you get that on the field. You gotta have that confidence. So, so how about you whoop it on us there, Oz? Uh, little little PDG here, free boy, Franklin. Do what? <laughs> hey, how about you whip us on some of them tips? Oh man, some tips. All right. Oz, do select. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Okay. Now we're in the control room of the submarine, and I'm gonna say, uh, Denise, rig the ship for test depth. Jordan, take the ship down to test depth, and Rick, full dive on the Fairwater Plains because we are going down. All Wait, right. can you repeat what I'm supposed to do again? <laughs> you, you are supposed to take the ship down to test depth is what you're supposed to do. Oh, we are so, this this submarine's crashing. I'm <laughs> not required to swim. the bottom of the sea now. <laughs> you, man, what kind of sailors are y'all? Oh, we were. I thought we were in a submarine. Okay. <laughs> Man, no sail on a submarine. Ooh. All right, all right. So we have. Uh, you you see my Excel now, right? Nope, not yet. Not yet. Oh. Share. Okay, got it. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, we just want these names. That's all, and we could use text to columns, right? Because, like this LSW, there's a comma, comma, but here, here's three commas, three commas. We don't need all of that. Okay, so we are going to go to first put this into a table. Always step one. That's right. And then power query from table. I'm kind of a geek. Uh oh. What was that? Does your Excel talk to you? No, that wasn't me. Uh, that was <laughs> okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to do now is split column by delimiter at the leftmost delimiter. Now you know with text to columns, if you did this with a comma, 
it's got it's got to do the comma or not, right? So if we did the commas and text the columns, it's gonna push Charles Yoshi and make four columns, right? It's mm -hmm. not just gonna do one. So in Power Query, we have a choice. We can do the leftmost, rightmost, or each occurrence. So I'm gonna do the leftmost because I only want the names. Okay, now I notice this. There's a space there, so we've got to mm -hmm. deal with that. Transform, trim. Great. Okay, so now the code is being recorded over here. Right, so I've got the data. I want to say close and load. Wow. Now this is one thing that I don't like. I'm gonna put this date back to a short date. All right. So that's great. But wait a minute. Gosh darn it. There were these other names down here. Somebody tricked me. Go up here. The table absorbs it. I'll go back over here and I'm going to refresh. Oh, God, look what happened. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Look at that. It trimmed the uh, extra space out in everything. That's Power Query. That's Power Query. And we have the, the date format set. That is awesome. That oh. is awesome. Oh my gosh. And Can the church say amen? <laughs> you, you know what's what I'm what I'm loving about that, aside from the fact that it's a really cool tip? Is it as excited as Oz and I'm sure people are watching are about that tip? Where the world that I came from when Pass started in SQL Server, that's the kind of stuff that the, the SQL Server crowd also digs, right? So this is really um, a great synergy here. This oh. kind of geeking out over the power of what you can do with your tools. Um, okay. That's very cool. Wow. Uh, wow. That's, that's five yeah. Sirachis, man. That, that, makes a, that makes a dragon want to retire, man. <laughs> right now. Oh, oh, yeah. So, so Denise, um, so I wonder when you bring back the secret world, so um, how would you do that in SQL? Or, or why is this interesting? Why aren't you saying, oh, I could do this in SQL oh. 10 years ago? Uh, well, maybe I could. I mean, sure, you can do a lot of things in SQL. Uh, but it was more the, it, it's more the idea that what we all have in common is how much we appreciate what you can make the tech do, right? Mm. And, and the mm. power of knowing how to do it and the, the power of learning a new tip like that, that someone could get back to their desk on Monday and maybe you just save them an hour, right? Yes. Um, yes. My, the whole when I first started going to past conferences, that was what kept me coming back because I would learn some trick I could do as a DBA that I didn't know before, right? And so wow. it's um, I'm excited about the idea that the past BA conference is going to bring that same sort of experience to people who are working with data. Beautiful. Particularly if they, uh, if they type in Excel TV in the in the code. Keep yes, off. that's my Excel tip. I'll give my Excel tip now, right? Oh, Excel enough. TV, if you register for past business analytics conference, you save three hundred dollars mm -hmm. if you use the code Excel TV. Yeah. And I tell you, this you know, it 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 feels good to be to have this opportunity to go to pass and share this kind of stuff. Well, that that's what really matters to me because um you know, like my, my passion for getting up and helping those those customers that were calling in. I also feel that passion for the the um the business people that is taking them a whole day to do this yeah. kind of stuff. Right. Look, you know, yeah, I, I could charge you a whole bunch of money to do it myself, but no, no do it for your customers. I want to empower you to do this for your customers. And uh, since since Oz missed the cue here, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, uh, Denise, the uh, that that tip of the Excel TV coupon code. Uh, Five Sirachis. Easy. easy <laughs> <five>. <laughs> All right. We say Sirachis down here in down here in Mexico, Florida. Very cool. Sirachis. All right. Cool. Cool. 
All right. How about you, Gordon? All right. So, you know what? Um, this is a tip near and dear to my heart. It has to do with data visualization. So let's just jump over. I'm going to show you my screen over here. Now, when I do my talks, um, I find that a lot of people actually haven't dealt a whole lot with sparklines before. You know, despite their being around since 2009. That's the correct answer, as we found out tonight. Um, so <laughs> that, so it, I just wanted to show everyone some cool things you can do with sparkline. So over here, uh, I have uh, several years, and then I have several months of tornado data. And I actually got rid of the months, January through December here, for this example, because they're not necessarily um, needed. And then we have the total amount over on the right. So I'm going to jump to the completed tab just to show you um, what I've created. And we'll zoom out just a little bit. So here we actually have spark lines, which um, are the small multiple charts of this data here. And what I've allowed users to do is they can hit this minus here, and they can shrink that information. Because they want to see, let's, we may want to see all this information up front. We want to see it immediately. So now, rather than be sort of bogged down by all the data in those tables, you can actually see these small um, spark lines immediately. And these bar charts reflect the numbers that were um, that you can click here and expand and see. So if you go go down, I also have the highest point highlighted, and we actually see that the high point here is um, it tends towards the middle, but it does appear uh, a little bit that there's more variation um, in the earlier years. Now, what that means, I don't really know, but it's something that you can tell with the data. So let's talk about how to make sparklines. So I'm back here in the raw data tab. I'm going to click on my column B. I'll go to insert. That's going to get me a nice space here, and these cells are where your sparklines are going to sit. So this is what makes sparklines so interesting, um, or spark charts, or however you want to call them. Um, they're also, they go by the name small multiples, um, several names, but they sit inside the cell. Now, previously, if you wanted to make something like this in Excel, you had to do a series of font tricks. But here, um, starting from Excel 2010, which came out in 2009, and newer, you don't actually need to do those font tricks anymore. So here I'm going to click. I'm on the Insert tab. I'm in cell B2. Uh, I'm going to click on this column. And here uh, they're asking, what is my data range? Well, we know what my data range are, is. It's going to be C2 through N2. I'm just going to select that. And then I'll just hit OK, because we know what the um, location range is. And you see that it populated with, a, with the spark lines. Now, here's what's great about this. They also kind of work like functions that I can just drag down. And you see that it's actually going to fill up with all the information. So unlike a chart, you know, Excel charts, I have to select the data and then select the region. There's no easy way to do what I just did. But Sparklines makes that a lot easier um, by allowing me to drag down and parallel what I'd like to see. So you see that it started out with this blue font. You know, maybe I don't like that blue font. I can go up here and I can say sparkline color. Maybe I make it kind of a lighter gray. Um, but I may want to see the high point. In this case, I've clicked that high point. I don't know if that is the default or if I set that default previously, but it gives you this red. So now you see very quickly what the high, um, where you know the distribution of that high month is. And I can um, scroll down and I can see how it changes through the years. So what's really cool about this is I can see sort of this intra comparison. That is, I can see what the months are for a given year. And then I can see what, the, what they are across a number of years. So that's really cool. But now that we have this information, we probably want to hide everything else. So I'm going to actually just select, um, I'm going to select columns or cells C through O. Actually, I think when I want to select cells C through N, we'll see if I uh, do this right. And then I'm going to click data. And here I'm going to click the group button because I want to group them, right? So what grouping allows you to do is um, show and hide columns very quickly. You see it drew this line here. And now there's a minus. I'm going to click that minus to make them shrink. Now you see that my data disappeared, so we're going to have to fix that. But, um, but this is something to keep in mind that when you hide data on spark lines, the default setting is to make it disappear. So what's again really cool, and this is why I want to show you this example, I click on cell B2. Now notice I haven't highlighted every spark line, but it's drawn this blue line uh, around them. So that means the change I'm going to make to one is going to be the change I make to all. So I've selected cell B2. I'm going to go to hidden and empty cells. So I click that design um, context tab, which comes up when you click within a sparkline group. I'll click hidden and empty cells. And I'm going to say, show the data in hidden, hidden and empty cells. Now, I just made this change to the first one. But again, it's going to make the change across all of them, because they're considered part of a group. So I'm going to shrink that. 
And now we have this great data visualization, very dashboard-like, not exactly a dashboard, but it, it does follow these dashboard principles that we love to talk about. So I love Sparklines. I think they're a great tool. I think a lot of folks are still kind of scared to use them because they don't know what they are yet. You know, they're just getting off Excel 2003. They had their breakup <laughs> from Excel 2003. They're just getting off. But now they're ready. They're ready to be taken in in loving arms by Sparklines, by Excel 2013. That's right. I, I say embrace it. I am, embrace it, you know? Embrace it. Embrace it. Yes. Yes. I knew you'd like that tip, Oz. That one was just That's, for you. I mean, just just the whole um, the grouping, the sparkling, all of that, all of that. Um, I'm thinking of um, it's like the grouping piece, and then just helping deal with clutter, and somebody can see that out of you know. Now, question for you: Can you? Um, hmm, okay. I wonder if, uh, say, uh, our form control can toggle that open and close, or the high points and other things. Um, I don't think it can be done without VBA. I could be wrong on that. I'm not a Sparklines expert. Um, I'm not really sure. Now, you could probably toggle the high point. Mm, no, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's some formula tricks. I can't think of. I, I probably could think of one in in the next hour or so, but not off the top of my head. The group thing, you probably need a, that you you would need um, some VBA for. But, and but, I like to say, you know, not everyone knows VBA, so I right. like to try to give responses that are, that can do virtually the same thing without the complication. Wonderful. Wonderful. Very, very uh, thoughtful of you. And it, that's good. That's a really good <laughs> tip there. So deserving of every drop of five bottles worth of sriracha. All right. You know, you've never given a one bottle sriracha tip. I don't think you've ever ranked something one. It must be because our tips are great. No, you'd have to... Um, I've got to, two ones, I think. As a result of having hurt you. No, no, you'd have to come up with some Excel 2003 stuff. Something some way back from yesteryear. Even like how to enable Clicky, how to get Clicky or not Clicky, Clippy in 2013. Like if I created a <laughs> mod to do or something, or something so obscure that there'd be one person in the world using it. That that'd be a one. Anyway, all right. So, so speaking of one person in the world, let's assume you're that one person in the world wanting to know what's up in the world of Excel. Well, I got the. I got the medicine for what ails you. We're going to show me. You. We'll show you what's up this week. First off, this as a Mac guy, as a Mac user, this was cool. First off, you can see my desktop, right? Yep. Okay. Right. This was cool. Uh, so you can download now on this office. You can use products.office.com. There's this Mac preview. So what this means, you can come over here, you can click this download, and this is a preview of what the next version of Office for Mac will look like, including Excel. And there's all <coughs> kinds of good things, including slicers, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot. I, I like the fact that the products are starting to come together uh, no matter what the platform is. You know, so I think that's just that's awesome. And if you're a Mac guy, Mac user, by all means, go over here and check this out. Get the release and check it out some. Um, next up, let's look over here. Microsoft launches an Android tablet for Excel users. What? So first off, we have the Mac news. Now we have the Android news. So there's a lot going on. This is over at the next web, thenextweb.com. And we'll put the... Put the uh, you know, the link down below, but it looks like they're launching an Android tablet keyboard for Excel users. Also, would like to remind everyone that the unviewable VBA project app for Excel and PowerPoint, the Indiegogo campaign is still going strong. There's 16 days left. They have already met everything they needed, but you can pick up some extra perks and just remind you what this is about. Um, there's a lot of things that don't get developed and productized in Excel because the people don't believe they can protect their code. 
And so, you know, this could end up being a very, a very good thing for the world of kind of Excel application development. So I'd encourage you to come over here to Indie, Indiegogo and check this out. And then last thing for you is NPR. NPR Planet Money had uh, a radio, you know, kind of a, a, a podcast this week to where they talked about how the electronic scrub, spreadsheet revolutionized business. And they went back and talked to the original guys who developed VisiCalc way back in the days, back in Harvard, all the way up to, you know, the most recent guy who won the Financial Modeling World Championship competition, or Model Off, in 2014. And they interviewed uh, Dear Mood Early, uh, who's the guy who, who won the championship with that. So there's just a heck of a lot going on in the world of Excel, and I'm certainly, uh, certainly excited to see it all. And I could be wrong. I did listen to it, but now I'm wondering if I'm right about this. But I'm pretty sure that Johan was interviewed too. Was it? I think he was. One of the, you know, as part they did talk about Model Off. They talked about Model Off. I listened to it. Else. They talked yeah. about. It. Yeah, now, those Australians all sound the same to me. <laughs> the whole continent, I just, okay. Um, so, also, Oz, you had some news? Um, here's one thing. Um, I want to share this, that on the PASS website, there are recordings, um, recorded interviews, and then interviews of the experts that will be there. And this Mr. Excel's interview uh, says, uh, Rob Colley is interviewing him. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not sharing my screen. Nope. Okay. See it now. Right. So, um, at this website, you can see interviews of the speakers, and here are a couple that can be listened to. And both of these are interesting. Uh, Miko talks about um, big data and, and challenges with analysts. Um, and Mr. Excel's interview was really good. And I really liked one response he gave when Rob asked him about what is a must-have with any analyst that you might consider hiring if you were hiring. And he said, somebody with the willingness and discipline to stop everything if they see something weird. And that, that is just so exciting to me because, yeah, yeah, there's so much to being a good analyst more than just um, you know, knowing how to do a VLOOKUP or work power pivot and all. You can't crumble when somebody does a 17% calculation in his head and throws his papers back at you. That, that's part of being an analyst. You can't be scared of people doing that. Um, then the other thing I want to share not that. Um, this meetup that is uh, Sounds like someone's getting a call. I mean, okay, so um, I'm going to be teaching data munging, and I just found out that it's called data munging. I never knew that. All right, it I is. It, yeah, clean and data. I don't like that name. Right. <laughs> but um, this is exciting because it is um, a data science group. And I'm used to tension be being between Excel users and, and data scientists, but I come here, and it's been a really good experience. Um, so I'm a, so 40 people say that they're coming. This is going to be next Wednesday, 6:30 p.m. downtown Portland at 506 Southwest Sixth Street on the second floor. It's going to be a good time. Let me come back. To you all, stop sharing. Um, so that is my news, and um, I'm wondering what Denise would have to say about a, a must-have with analysts, being an analyst. So I, 
I think it is curiosity and tenacity um, mm -hmm. and business acumen. Uh, those would be my, what I'd look for because you can learn the tools and you can learn the techniques, right? Yeah. But if you don't understand what questions to ask yeah. and what problem you're trying to solve, then the tools don't help you much. Yeah, yeah. And you have to be able to guide the people who are asking you for the data. If they're asking the question, you've got to ask, ask them questions back, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's my news. How about you? Uh, how about you, Jordan? Well, I have some news. Um, you may have noticed under my uh, my lower third, as they call that, where it says Jordan Goldmeyer, there's no mention of my consulting company can be a factor. Um, probably nobody noticed that, but that's okay. The reason the reason it's gone is actually there's there's been some changes in my life. So you know, when I started my company last year, I was it was really um, it was really based off of certain things uh, going certain ways, but the thing is that um, some things have changed in, in my life, um, and there was a point where I was talking to my wife, you know, and, and we came to this conclusion that I really do need to get a job, <laughs> just because of the things that changed, um, you know. So I, I did like consulting and being an entrepreneur, and I was, I think it was fairly, I thought at least I was good at it, but um, because the certain things didn't work out, I do need to get a job. And in fact, I've actually taken a job with um, Ernst and Young, so. If you were considering with uh, consulting with me, I am not allowed uh, to consult through Cambia Factor anymore, but I am still allowed to train. So the training is still going on, the website is still there, um, and I still will be doing things through that brand, and um, chances are it's not going to go away. Uh, in the next few years, it's probably going to start back up again once we sort of realize what we're doing. But in the meantime, I'm going to be working with Ernst & Young, which is a really good company, and they uh, were one of the big sponsors of Model Off, so we're hoping really to do a lot of great things this year, and there's not a whole lot of, lot of change there, but you won't see me promoting my consulting company here anymore. So that's really my heartfelt change. In Excel TV, I'm still allowed to be part of it. Their lawyers said it was okay. I think they said, I think they will say it's okay, actually. I haven't gotten a full confirmation, but Man. that was one of the conditions. So said Excel TV stays. All right. This is the first time I've heard, I, I think... I can do Excel TV. You kind of sleep slam that. In no, there. no, I made it sound like that. No, no, Excel TV staying. I mean, they basically said this is we're do we're doing it. I said this is you know, and they're like, all right, well, just you know, I went up through like seven channels, and I got to make sure I hear from the final channel. But nobody said this is going to be a problem. And you know, obviously, I would choose. You know, I wasn't bad at consulting, so I mean, for myself, so I would. You know, this is part of it. Um, we, I left my other position you know, uh, in 2013, or at the beginning of 2014, because we had been talking, and Excel TV was like this thing that we'd been dreaming for so long, so it's not, go it's not going anywhere anytime soon, or at least I'm not going anywhere. Um, still going to deliver you great challenges with nuanced answers. So he's, he's still going yeah, to give the same care and thought to the challenges in the future that he did in the past. Uh, right. I will expect I would expect quality to stay the same or go down. <laughs> no. Nice. Love the self deprecation. All right. All right. Well uh, and, and how about you, Denise? So um, there's just a couple more things about the conference I'd like to highlight in, uh, as we should close up here. With some, um, you guys have heard about all the sessions that the three of you are doing, and we've mentioned Mr. Excel speaking. I did want to add that um, Chandu is giving a, a lab, so a hands-on lab, no additional cost, two hours training with Chandu. Um, also, Ken Poles is doing a two-hour lab. So there's some like real practical content, and all you have to do is register for the conference to attend those. And if you really like uh, full day training. We have a whole day of pre-conference sessions, uh, including one given um, by Rob Colley and Avi Singh from Power Pivot Pro. And so there's there's just a lot of Excel content. And then you know, uh, Oz mentioned uh, Miko Yuck, who's our day two keynote speaker. We're really excited to have Miko talking about data visualization. She's a, such a dynamic and uh, exciting speaker. And then there's a, our day one keynote, um, who's Carlo Ratti, who is an architect, an actual building architect by trade, right? And he runs the Sensible City Lab at MIT, which is all about urban planning and understanding cities and how we live through all the sensors that are collecting data around us. And I, I, if, you've seen his if you haven't seen his TED Talk, go watch his TED Talk. It's going to be, I think, a great keynote. We're really excited to have him. So there's a lot of good content. So passbiaconference.com 
Excel TV discount code gets you three hundred dollars off your registration. All right, all right, go get it. Take three hundred dollars off. Just go in and put Excel TV right there in that coupon code. That's right. So thank you for that. So uh, hey, where can you find us? Well, we're everywhere. But in addition to being everywhere, we're over here on on, on the side of of that right there. So. Lots going on. So the you know we we started the website gosh about six months ago, and maybe in the last six weeks or so we kind of gave it a uh, a facelift, put a fresh coat of paint on it, and wow things have just really been taken off lately. So thanks to all of you who have who have joined us over there, who have answered the challenges over there, and we just kind of we went and looked at who answered the challenges this week, and gosh it was uh, it was quite a few people out there. So thank you very much for for reading all of the content, and here's what's been happening, you know, all of, where before what we used to do is just take, we we take a show like this and we slice it up into maybe 10 videos and we have 10 YouTube videos. Now what we're trying to do is turn those into 10 blog posts where we actually, not only do you have the video, but you'll also have the, the Excel download, and you would also have a step-by-step -step kind of here's how you would go about doing the tips that Oz just gave you, that Jordan just gave you, and here's where you can find the news, and here's the links to everything instead of us just talking about it through video. So I'd encourage you to go over there to our website. Um, additionally, you know, we're coming up on a few milestones here. Um, if you could have, well, this time last year, this time last year in one week, uh, we did not exist. All right, 53, if you could get in a time machine and go back 53 weeks, you could stop this from ever happening. Uh, so too late. No take backs. No take backs. Too late. <laughs> what we're here. So, so take that. <laughs> take that, forum people. Forum. That's forum. Forum people. Take that. Hmm. So, uh, so uh, check check us out. Also on Facebook, we're nearing 500 likes. We've only been around a year, so thank you for that. And uh, about 1,800 YouTube subscribers. So thank you very much for that as well. So uh, with that, gosh, I would encourage all of you, every single person. Uh, go over to the past BA conference website. Go ahead and get signed up. I mean, go ahead and put in the. I mean, get three hundred dollars off. You know? Yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like three hundred dollars, man. Mm -hmm. You get to see Oz's bow tie, right? Nice. You get to see Oz's hat. Yeah. That's that's worth. Okay, so that's three hundred dollars for the coupon. I mean, that's <laughs> one hundred fifty for that. Get to see the hat and the tie. You get to see Chan do. That's another four hundred dollars. Oh man. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. So I'd encourage y'all to head out over there. So Denise, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it was it was fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, the, the real cool thing is is during the conference we're gonna be um yeah you know, we're gonna blog during the entire conference. So you're gonna see it's gonna be a lot. You're gonna get a lot of knowledge of what's going on at that conference. But that's only gonna be useful if you're there. So go ahead and go ahead and go there. And then if you're not, you'll be able to read read about it on our blog as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Denise. And don't forget the Excel TV code that you can go ahead and put in on their website. Yeah. So that's it, guys. Man, we just finished up the our fifth quarter of shows. You're yeah. not gonna see us again until April. Sorry. That's the way it does. I mean Oz, Oz has taken a nap. No. Jordan <laughs> kind of get ready for his new job. Got a, a stretch. Uh, yep. We're going to break. Yep. All right. Uh, so we'll see you guys all in April. So until next time, this is Rick Grantham with Oz Du Soleil and the soon to be employed Jordan Goldmeyer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And until next time, until April, keep on excelling.